I remember the first computer game we ever got. Since hardly anyone owned computers in those days, you had to use your television set for a monitor. By plugging a cable into the antenna jack, you could turn the TV into a primitive video arcade. Then you could play ping pong in monochrome. You operated a little paddle that moved down along one side of the screen. The ball, actually a white bip, moved horizontally. And with enough coordination, you could get the battle to intersect the trajectory. Whereupon, you heard the game's sole sound effect. Bip. And so it went. Bip, 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 bip. If you got good at it, you could crank up the speed. Bip, 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 bip. People in our home who shall remain nameless played it for hours. After a few years, Atari became all the rage. As I recall, Atari initially had four different games. My favorite was called Adventure. It was your basic dungeon and dragons genre with different castles, rooms, a key, hidden doorways, a bat that could steal the key, even whole areas where the obstacles were invisible. Our whole family really got into it. The kids, of course, quickly surpassed their parents. They would come home from school with new tips and tricks. Some of them were even undocumented, which is computer talk for saying that such maneuvers were not written down in any manual. One of the most amazing came home from junior high with my daughter. In a particular place, inside the black castle, the diligent searcher could find a small white dot that was too small to be noticeable as a normal game object. Indeed, if you did find it, you would think it was probably just a glitch in your video monitor. But by taking this dot back to the starting screen, you could enter a hidden, otherwise inaccessible room. Entering the room had absolutely nothing to do with playing the game. All you would find in the room was a, a rainbow and the name of the person who invented the game. For all I know, every computer programmer does something like this. Somewhere behind some hidden wall, available only to the initiated, there is another room. And in that room is the name of the artist. What I want to know is, if the signature of the creator is not just in some hidden room, but in every created thing, why can't we see it? I once heard of a man whose dental work made it possible for him to actually hear radio broadcasts Somehow the combination of fillings in his teeth accidentally turned his mouth into a primitive receiver. But he found the sound so distracting that he had the fillings replaced. The radio signals were still there. He just chose not to hear them anymore. A few years ago, one of my sons brought home a new computer game. This was not one of those video arcade contraptions with primitive little animated characters chasing one another around the screen or spaceships shooting at alien invaders. It didn't even require split-second visual reflexes. It's a new breed, he told me. It's called virtual reality, Dad. You play it by entering it. Your only chance winning is by imagining that you are actually inside it. Instead of asking, how do I win this game, you ask, what would I do if I really lived in this world? At the beginning of this game, it's called Mist, you look at the screen and find yourself on an island. There's a dock, a forest, buildings, stairways. The graphics and the sound effects are impressive and convincing. But there are no instructions, no rules. You go places by aiming a little pointing finger and clicking. You can look up, you can look down, you can turn around, climb stairs, wander all over the place. Everywhere your curiosity leads you, there are things to discover and learn and remember. There are machines you can operate, a library full of books you can open and read. 
After a while, the dedicated player will discover how to leave the island and go to other mysterious places. Devotees say the game is properly played over weeks and even months. With my learning curve, it may take years. And the purpose of it all? Why, of course, to figure out what you're doing there. But to do that, you must first figure out how the place works. What fascinates me here is not yet another sophisticated and clever way to waste time in front of the computer screen. I can do that with File Manager. It is the concept of a game whose purpose is for the player to discover the purpose. Virtual reality, smirtual reality, this ain't no game. What's going on here? Why am I here? What are the rules? How do my behavior, how does it affect what's going on? Upon hearing all this, Alan Feldman, a friend who is a professor of English, suggested that it seemed a lot like childhood. I'd go farther. It may be a lot like adulthood, too. We all find ourselves in this world, and the object seems to be to figure out what we're doing here. Unfortunately, most of the ways one thing is connected to or dependent upon another thing are not immediately apparent. If we live long enough, take careful notes, and listen to those who have gone before us, we stand a chance. After all, meaning is primarily a matter of relationship. If something is connected to absolutely nothing, symbolically, linguistically, physically, psychologically, it is literally meaningless. And in the same way, if something is connected to everyone and everything, it would be supremely meaningful. I suppose it would be God, the one through whom everyone and everything else is connected, the source of all meaning. Religious traditions are the collected rules of the game. They tell us how the world works. And if you play by them, you are rewarded, hopefully before it's time to leave, with an understanding of why you are here, with what is otherwise known as the meaning of life. Now, while my new virtual reality computer game may be infuriatingly intricate and frustrating, at least I have the comfort of knowing that it was designed by someone. I, I may not be clever enough to figure out its purpose, but it does have one. Its rules can be learned, it can be completed, it has an end. Life, on the other hand, comes with no such implicit guarantee. And its time frame and playing field are literally beyond our comprehension. What if there were a virtual reality computer game that was programmed to approximate real life? I mean, if you could design such a program, what would be the object? The way I see it, there are only a few rules. The first rule of the game of life is that you cannot decide when to begin playing. One day, out of the blue, you realize, oh, I'm playing. Someone or something else determined when the game would begin. And it wasn't your parents. They may have known about the birds and the bees and even set out to conceive a child, but they didn't have a clue it was going to be you. And now that they've had a chance to meet you, while they most likely love you, they'd probably have picked someone else. In religious language, this means that you are a creature. Someone else made you. And you are neither its partner nor its puppet. You are its manifestation, its agent, its child. The second rule is that you cannot decide when to stop playing the game either. One day, out of the blue, you're dead. For a slogan on the box of the game of life, we could use something that I saw on a t-shirt. Life. You're not going to make it out alive. That means there's no way you can win the game by staying in it forever. 
No matter how many points, toys, honors, conquests, dollars you accumulate, sooner than anyone expects or wants, the game is abruptly over. You hear a little chime, maybe a buzzer. The keyboard freezes, the screen goes blank, the game ends without warning. Nothing you acquire, accomplish, or believe will have any effect whatsoever on when the game ends. But there's good news. Dying does not mean you lose. It's what you do before you die that determines whether or not you win when you die. <clears throat> the third rule, just to keep you on your toes, is that each player is issued apparently random, undeserved gifts and handicaps throughout the progress of the game. Figuring out why you got the combination package you did transforms all disabilities into gifts, just as refusing to figure out why you were issued what you received transforms all gifts into disabilities. My father used to say that all men are not created equal, some get dealt a full house, others a pair of twos. The question, therefore, is not whether you deserve the hand you were dealt, but how you choose to play it. The fourth rule is that points are awarded whenever you can discern the presence or the signature of the Creator, and then act so as to help others see it too. The signature is not just in objects, but in actions and thoughts and feelings, not just in sunshine and happiness, but in agony, struggle, and even death. Remember, finding the signature and then acting in such a way so as to help others find it too is the only way to accumulate game points. And the last rule? The last rule is that everything is connected to everything else. Therefore, life is supercharged, permeated, and overbrimming with purpose and meaning. Most of the time, we are oblivious to it. We go about our lives as if every event were an accident. And then something happens and we see the connection. For just a moment, it is unmistakable. We are astonished that we couldn't see it until now. All creation, one great unity. There are no coincidences throughout all creation, just beneath the surface, joining each person to every other person and every other thing in a luminous organism of sacred responsibility, we discover invisible lines of connection. Now that's my idea of a game. <laughs>